guys. AB here from B&H. And I'm Doug from B&H. I'm an audio guy and Doug's more of a video guy. And today we're gonna have dialogue about dialogue. <laughs> you really went there, didn't you? I, I did, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If you are somebody who is a video producer, particularly on a smaller scale, if you're shooting things on your own a lot, or in smaller crews, a lot of times you're not only recording the audio on your own, but you're also mixing the audio on your own in the edit. Now for this video, we're using lav mics yep, um, yep. In, a, in a more cinematic setup uh, or something a little more narrative. You probably would use a boom mic, but uh, in this case, and in a lot of interview situations, you're probably gonna use a lavalier microphone. In many cases, somebody will record to a field recorder to really have a separate unit uh, to record to. We decided to record straight to camera uh, for the purposes of this demo, and you'll see why later. But really, as long as you're recording a good signal to a device that has at least decent preamps, um, you should be, that's, that's a good start. We thought for this, as AB just said, it's probably closest to what a lot of our viewers are doing, and they're trying to get the best results out of that. Absolutely. So what does it really mean to mix audio in general? I mean, mixing audio means different things to different people, but I think in general, you're trying to find a specific place for specific elements in your whole project so that each thing stands out and doesn't necessarily intrude on the other, depending on the style of mixing uh, you're doing. So, you know, if you've got a bunch of vocals, you wanna make sure that they're at appropriate levels, not one not too loud and the other too soft. If you've got backing tracks or if you've got music, uh, music bed underneath your dialogue, you wanna make sure that it's audible, but it's not something that's maybe taking over. Yeah, overpowering. Mm -hmm. More and more lately with, uh, especially internet video, short, digital content, like very much like what we're doing. The editors really have to take on that role of doing some, at least some basic sound mixing. And it's very important because it, 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 it really sets apart what is a polished product and an, an unpolished product. And you, and you can tell that, 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 extra, that extra mile that some, some productions will go. And some people will also argue that you may be able to get away with something that visually isn't quite perfect, but sounds great. The opposite is not always true. In fact, it's almost never true. If you can't hear something or it sounds terrible, it really takes away from the entire production. So audio is, 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 is paramount to, uh, to an overall solid uh, video production. You know, you see a lot of low budget cinema and it's still, you're willing to forgive it right. if the audio is good. Right, that's true. Basically all video is mixed. Anything you hear is mixed. Right, right now, this is mixed. <laughs> and so what I just wanna show you is also what this recording sounds like with no processing and no channel mapping whatsoever. Starting now. Hey. I'm over here. <laughs> and I'm over here. So if you're listening to this right now, you're probably noticing that one of us is on one side of your head and the other is on the on other side. side. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's because we're recording a stereo pair to one recorder on the camera. Uh, there are two tracks. They are both independent, but they are considered a stereo pair, so they're panned on the left and right. right. In post, the first thing you're going to want to do if you have an interview set up like this is you're gonna to wanna to separate those tracks. Now all the examples coming up are using Adobe Premiere because that's what we use in our office. But in pretty much any other nonlinear editor, you have the option to assign channels to different mappings. Assuming all your clips were recorded the same way, if you have everything loaded up into a bin, you can just select everything, right click, go to Modify, Audio Channels, and then you'll see a few options laid out. By default, you'll see Stereo, Number of Tracks is one, followed by left and right down below. Now this just corresponds to which channel gets which side. You can flip these if you want, but in this case what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to the top, change stereo to mono, and then change the track count to two. This gives us two separate mono tracks that we can then assign channels from the source. So channel one, which is mono, would be the left. Channel two, which is also now mono, would be the right. Now it doesn't actually matter that they're left and right because once you hit OK, since they're both mono, they're gonna automatically play from the center. OK, and now we're back. Processing in hand, we sound better. So speaking of mixing audio for video, um, are there differences in terms of techniques when you're mixing for TV versus web versus a full feature film, for example? Yeah, definitely, for sure. Especially, I would say, for film, which I can't comment too much on, but. Uh, for most video, it really depends on the genre and the medium. So TV in general is more compressed, film is generally less compressed. Right. If you go to the movie theater, you'll know sometimes 
the sounds are just all over you and they're mm -hmm. booming and there's an explosion that happens and it it rattles, it literally rattles the, the walls. <laughs> right. And whereas TV will rarely, if ever, do such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Again though, with TV, it does vary a bit. I would say like a talk show or a late night show or news or sports is very compressed. Right. Um, there's, there's very little dynamic range going on in there, at least from what I've heard generally. Whereas a, a, a dramatic show um, would probably be a little more uh, like film. And the web is, this is kind of the problem, the web is all over the place. Yes, right. this, this is This is really what it comes down to is that there's, uh, first off, there's not many standards in place. Sure. And there's there's different levels of production that have, that have gone out there. It's open to anybody. Well, anyone can post anything, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful thing, but right. it, it leads to productions that have uh, music that's way too loud, right. dialogue that's all over the place. It's not equipment based. It's 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 situational. It's uh, the mix. Yeah, like it comes it and... comes down in the end a lot of it to the mix. How does one really develop an ear for what a good mix is? Like anything else, developing a good ear for mixing involves. A, definitely listening to good mixes. Um, what the industry deems uh, as, wow, this is a great mix, or this engineer did a great job on this album. Um, you know, there's so much stuff out there now that it's very easy to find examples of uh, albums, for example, in my realm, um, that were mixed very well, uh, where you can hear everything. It's clear, it's, it's, it's got punch. You can actually probably find out exactly what the engineer did. In fact, he or she may have a web series where they show you mm -hmm. um, how they mixed this one hit pop song. Obviously with video, you have that element where you have to see what you're working on. Yeah. With audio, I find that sometimes we get too hung up on what we're looking at because there's so many beautiful plugins out there and ultimately your ears are the best tools you have to become a good mixer. What if things sound different on different devices? Like what if it sounds great on this stereo, but then it sounds not so great on these headphones. Do you guys uh, experience that when mixing audio for video as well? Yes, <laughs> yes, all the time. But I think the hardest thing to, to come to grips with is when it should, in a way, when it should almost sound worse on one setup versus another. And that comes down to, at least from my experience, that comes down to uh, the intended medium. And so ultimately, if you're trying to mix a commercial, you're gonna wanna listen to a commercial and develop an ear for what a commercial probably is gonna sound like. Right. And they sound pretty compressed, pretty very compressed actually, right. and they sound almost thin, almost, almost like tinny. On, on headphones at least. Right. But on a speaker, especially a TV speaker, which is pretty basic speaker that's built right, right. into your Very TV. Standard. Yeah, it, it doesn't have a lot of punch to it, but it needs to work. All right, so we're gonna take a look at some basic mixing techniques for your videos and show you how to get better sounding audio. Let's take a look at one of our videos. First crack at the Sigma 50 millimeter I think we have on here. Next, we'll recreate this from scratch step by step. Let's solo the dialogue track and give it a listen. First crack at the Sigma 50 millimeter I think we have on here. It's a solid recording, but this wouldn't stand out in a mix. And the biggest issue is that the speaking volume is all over the place. Everyone's voice is different and people tend to change their volume as they speak, sometimes dramatically. So what we'll do is add compression to the track mixer. So real quick, hmm. what is compression? Compression is a tool used to maintain a certain audio level so that you don't hear really loud things when someone's talking and then all of a sudden he talks really quietly and you can't hear him. You really wanna maintain some consistency so that the listener doesn't have to either strain to hear what's going on or- Adjust the volume. Or adjust the volume because it's too loud or too soft. So that's really kind of the, the go-to tool that many audio engineers would, would use to tame a vocal or to set it somewhere that's relatively constant. Back in Premiere, I'm going to use Dynamics Processing as my compressor, but there are other options as well. The basic options for a compressor are the threshold and ratio. There's also the attack and release, which impact the speed at which the compressor kicks in, but for this demo, we're leaving them at the default. Unlike other compressors, Dynamics Processor presents these options graphically. I'm going to start with a threshold of negative 25 decibels and increase the ratio to roughly 5 to 1. The audio should sound more even at this point. First crack at the Sigma 50 millimeter I think we have on here. Now I'm going to exaggerate the effect for a denser broadcast sound, but you can lighten it up if you want for a more natural sound. 
Let's lower the threshold even further to negative 30 and then increase the ratio to almost 10 to 1. Since compression lowers the overall output level, makeup gain brings it back. Let's hear it. First crack at the Sigma 50 millimeter I think we have on here. Lastly, you're gonna want to apply different compression settings for each speaker as every person sounds different. Next, let's lay down some background music. First crack at the Sigma 50 millimeter I think we have on here. It sounds a lot better now, but I'm not feeling some of the instruments in the arrangement. Because they're higher pitched, they distract from the voice, even if the volume is lower. The solution here is to use equalization or EQ. Load up the parametric equalizer on the clip level here so that you don't affect other music tracks the same way. We want to reduce those high pitches, right? So let's start in the mid to upper range. Tighten up the Q factor, raise it up several decibels, and play back the track as you move the slider across the frequency range. The Sigma 50 millimeter I think we have on here? Yeah. First impressions of the 50 millimeter, we're doing more portrait style right now, right? Yeah, everything was really sharp and the shallow lens gives it a really nice, nice depth. This will emphasize the problematic sounds and allow you to cut that frequency instead. First crack at the Sigma 50 millimeter I think we have on here? Yeah. First impressions of the 50 millimeter, we're doing more portrait style right now, right? First crack at the Sigma 50 millimeter I think we have on here? Yeah. First impressions of the 50 millimeter, we're doing more portrait style right now, right? Yeah, everything was really sharp and the shallow lens gives it a really nice, nice depth. I'm glad you actually cut the frequencies you found problematic in that example because it really highlights the proper usage of EQ. A lot of people don't really understand how to use EQ effectively. A lot of professional engineers will tell you that proper EQing involves cutting frequencies you don't want while it's maybe slightly boosting frequencies you do want. Um, and I think this is one of the most underused uh, techniques and just processes out there in audio. I mean, EQing can really make or break your track. When given the chance, use a parametric EQ. It's gonna give you a lot of flexibility in terms of really dialing in the sound you want across the frequency spectrum. All right, so let's talk about the thing that everybody wants to hear about <laughs> is gear. Right. The, the room, the, sure. the environment you're in, the, the monitors you're gonna use, the, sure. the headphones you're gonna use, if there's any sound treatment, what can you say about that? Really, you wanna mix in an environment that's A, comfortable to mix in, and I mean, when I say comfortable, I don't mean uh, sonically only, but even just physically comfortable. Physically, yeah. You know, it's, it's important to work uh, you know, in a chair that's comfortable and have a monitor uh, whether it be speaker monitors and or a computer monitor at a level that doesn't strain you. On top of that, you mentioned speakers and headphones. Very important to have a monitoring system uh, that you are familiar with and that you trust. I think it's more important to really use gear that you're comfortable with, that you get familiar with over time. Um, and to sort of piggyback on what you discussed earlier in this video, monitoring on several different pieces of gear. Watch something that you've produced on TV, you know? Watch it on your phone. I mean, you could probably speak more to the visual element of that, but I, in, with audio, it's definitely important to, to utilize multiple uh, pieces of gear to yeah. reference your, your stuff. Definitely a couple of good pairs of headphones. Sony MDR7506 headphones, which are really a standard. Uh, in, for a reason. For a reason in the audio world. I mean, some people say they're a little bit bright, but really, if you get used to those, they tend to translate pretty well if you if you really have a lot of uh, familiarity with them. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. One thing I have found for myself is that open earphones, open back headphones, have a lot more accuracy when it comes to stuff like that. For example, I have Sennheiser HD 600s, which are a great pair of headphones, and, and they're really, really accurate. Speakers, monitor speakers, they're ubiquitous. I mean, you can go to pretty much any major audio brand and find a pair of monitor speakers that are within your budget uh, and that reproduce sound uh, very well. So really choosing the right speaker uh, to recreate the sound that you're looking for and that's appropriate for the environment you're in. Um, last but not least, I mean, you might be able to speak more to this with regard to video, but certainly acoustical treatment. 
For, for mixing at least, I imagine you want as, as treated a, a room as possible. Bass frequencies are really the biggest culprit when you're mixing audio in general um, because they build up in the corners of your rooms. Sometimes you only have one little thing you've got to take care of and once you do that, you're, you're set to go. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a process of learning what your environment is like and using the tools that are best suited for that environment to really allow you to kind of mix the project you want and have it sound as good as you can possibly make it uh, given whatever the limitations of your room are. With mixing, I, I find that you really need to kind of adjust the volume, sometimes go a little higher, and then oftentimes go much lower. You also have to think about how it might sit as an ambient piece. Can I hear this if somebody put it on in the background? Yeah, it's important. And if you think about it, with the weather, you can. <laughs> if you leave the weather on, on the TV, you absolutely can hear it. And it, it's, it's something I think people should keep in mind. Listening at low volumes, very important. Most really good engineers who are accomplished will tell you that that's what they do. They will listen uh, for a long time at a low volume. I also sometimes listen in mono. This is also another technique that a lot of mixing engineers use. Uh, if it sounds good in mono, uh, there's a very good chance if you can hear everything in mono, I know that sounds counterintuitive because things are panned, but you'll still hear them. If you can hear it in mono, it's probably gonna sound really good in stereo. And, and I think you know that and other techniques that we've discussed really put together uh, are sort of a collective approach to how you would come up with the best product you can, um, you know, given your environment and, and your skill level. All right, well, I think we covered basically everything we could today. Yeah. And I know for you professional sound mixers out there, there's a lot more ground we could have covered. But if you wanna know more about sound mixing, subscribe to our channel or visit bhphoto.com. Thank you, AB, for having this conversation with me. Thank you. We'll see you next time. And if you've ever recorded room tone, which you should, it will be part of the design and mix. <laughs> okay. <laughs>